On the last Saturday in March, a gray and woolly day if there ever was one, Sandy Rutledge of Rutledge's Hardware Store on River Street in Big Narrows, Cape Breton, stayed after everyone else had left for the day so he could organize the hardware store's first ever window display. Sandy graduated from business school last year, the first in his family to go to university. Ever since, he's been bugging his father to let him make some changes. Willard Rutledge finally relented. Sandy stayed late, and by Monday lunch, pretty much everyone had heard about Rutledge's new front window. People were making trips to town just to check it out. What Sandy did was clean out the mess of doorbells, the bags of bird seed, the towers of toasters and kettles that accumulated in the front window over the last 74 years. <laughs> and he replaced the entire jumble with a solitary mannequin. It, or, or more to the point, she, was wearing a bridal gown. Sandy picked up the mannequin and the gown secondhand from a shop in Sydney. The idea, it being just a few weeks until spring, was to encourage the brides of Big Narrows to register at the hardware store. <laughs> By the end of the week, much to Sandy's delight, they had two brides. And a third, Becky Michelle of Fletcher's Harbor, wavering under pressure from her fiancé, Cliff, who had wanted a nail gun since he was seven. <laughs> Dave's mother, Margaret, was one of the last people in town to see the window. Smith Gardner picks Margaret up every Thursday afternoon, and they go to the Elks meat raffle. On Thursday, as they pulled into Kerrigan's parking lot, Smith said, do you want to see the window? Margaret said, sure. As Margaret peered at the wedding dress, Smith said, I wouldn't want to go through that again. <laughs> Margaret nodded. And then they stood there awkwardly. That was the first time Smith and Margaret talked about marriage. When she got home, Margaret stared in her bathroom mirror. Uh-oh, she said. It was the middle of April when Smith decided to propose. He drove to Sydney to get the ring. His late wife, Jean, had hated her wedding ring. She said it irritated her finger. Eventually, she took it off and wore the ring around her neck on a chain. Smith didn't want Margaret to hate her ring, so all he bought was a diamond. The jeweler said they could come back together and choose a setting. It was a modest stone. But it has good color, said the jeweler, holding it up to the light. Smith dropped the bag on the passenger seat of his pickup. He pulled off the road as soon as he crossed the Seal Island Bridge. He shook the diamond into his rough hand, took a deep breath, and held it up in the sun. Didn't look like it had any color to him. <laughs> Looked as clear as glass. On his way through town, Smith stopped at Kerrigan's and bought a tub of ice cream. Margaret's favorite flavor, maple walnut. He took the ice cream to Margaret's house for Sunday lunch. He set the diamond on top of her ice cream. And then he set the bowl in front of her. He sat waiting, his heart pounding as she picked up her spoon. Margaret polished off the entire bowl and sat back. <laughs> that was good, she said. Not knowing what to say, Smith didn't say anything. He drove to Sydney the next morning. I want another diamond, he said. A bigger one with more color so it stands out. The jeweler put a blue velvet tray on the counter and showed him the stones. That one, said Smith. But this time, put it in a ring. What kind of setting, asked the jeweler. Comfortable one, said Smith. What size, asked the jeweler. Medium, said Smith. <laughs> the first warm weekend in May, they went to Ignish to visit Smith's son. On the way home, Smith said, let's go back the long way through the bay, Irish Bay, where Margaret grew up. Margaret almost said, it's getting late. Instead, she said, that'd be nice, Smith. 
They pulled off the highway at the gas station and came into town at the south end, past the Stinson farm and Dr. Sandberg's old place. It had been dark for an hour when Smith pulled up in front of the house where she grew up. Margaret said, so long ago. Smith said, let's go see if the iris are up. Margaret felt anxious. She didn't know the people who lived there anymore, city people. But Smith was already walking around the front of his pickup. Smith said, there's, there's no one home, just a peek. Against her better instincts, Margaret followed Smith across the damp lawn, the dew chilly on her feet. She was nervous, but she was also intrigued. She heard the click as he slid the gate latch in the darkness, and she followed him into the yard, the yard where she and Elizabeth had played when they were girls. It was so strange to be there again. She sighed. Then she smiled at Smith and turned to go. Smith didn't move. Slipping a ring on Margaret's finger under the moon in the garden where she had been a girl and had probably dreamed of such things had seemed like a good idea in the abstract. But here in the garden, it didn't seem like a good idea at all. Smith was feeling lightheaded and woozy. His legs were shaking. Smith? said Margaret. Smith had slipped the ring out of his pocket. He lurched forward and grabbed Margaret's hand. And Margaret, who hadn't seen the ring, could sense his unsteadiness. But it was his face that gave him away. It was written on his face. It was as clear as day. Smith was about to tell her that he was dying. <laughs> oh, Smith, she said. No. <laughs> no, said Smith. Margaret glanced down and saw the ring for the first time. She started to laugh. Smith had gone over this moment many times in his mind. He had imagined many responses, but never laughter. <laughs> Margaret said, oh, Smith. But before she could say anything else, a light flicked on upstairs and a window banged open. <laughs> Smith swore and he tugged her and Smith and Margaret ran out of the back garden and tumbled into his truck like a pair of teenagers. They ripped down the street, around the corner and all the way to the church before they stopped. My heart, said Smith, resting his head on the wheel. Margaret waited for him to saddle. When he did, she said, Smith Gardner, did you just ask me to marry you? <laughs> Smith didn't lift his head. He said, yes. Did you just refuse? <laughs> and Margaret said, no, Smith. The ring was too big. So they went back to the jeweler the very next morning and they had it sized. On the way out of the store, Margaret stopped, took it off her finger and slipped it into her purse. Smith said, why'd you do that? Margaret said, Smith. People are going to see it if I keep it on my hand. <laughs> Smith said, we certainly wouldn't want that. <laughs> For a week, Margaret didn't tell a soul. She fretted instead. Truth was, the whole thing embarrassed her. In her heart, she wished that she and Smith could do what the young kids do and move in together. After a week of fretting, she picked up the telephone. It was a Sunday afternoon. Smith had already told his kids. She couldn't delay any longer. She had to phone her daughter, Annie, in Halifax, and David. Hi, she said. How are you? She had been working in the garden. She was wearing her gardening slacks and an oversized cardigan that used to belong to her late husband, Charlie. She was standing by the kitchen window. Her hands still had dirt on them. She took a deep breath. She said, David, I have something to tell you. You're sick, said Dave. <laughs> Worse, said Margaret. <laughs> Smith asked me to marry him. Dave shouldn't have been so surprised. He knew that this was coming. Smith had as good as asked his permission that afternoon in the graveyard. When was that anyway? Two years ago. <laughs> he shouldn't have been surprised, but he was. So when Margaret blurted it out, Dave was not his best self. 
Margaret said, Smith asked me to marry him. And the very first thing Dave said was, where will you be buried then? <laughs> There's supposed to be a spot beside dad. Margaret said, I honestly hadn't considered that. Dave was as amazed as she was at what had just come out his mouth. He said, I, I, I suppose the fact that it doesn't really matter to me where you're buried won't stop you from telling everyone that that was my first reaction. <laughs> and Margaret said, probably not. <laughs> Dave didn't really want to talk about it, which was fine because neither did she. They talked about her garden instead. And then they said goodbye. When Margaret hung up, she shrugged. It was the first time she'd said it out loud, I'm getting married. That wasn't so bad, she said. She waited five minutes before she phoned Annie. Oh my God, said Annie, where will you be buried? <laughs> there was a stunned silence. And then Margaret said, David called you. And Annie snorted and they both laughed and laughed. When they stopped laughing, Annie said, Oh, Mom, I'm so happy for you. How did he ask? And Margaret said, He asked me under the moon in the garden in Irish Bay. And Annie said, I want to know every last detail. <laughs> now that she'd spoken the words out loud, Margaret figured she might as well keep going. Next morning, she went to Kerrigan's grocery store knowing that she'd bump into Winnie. Winnie always shopped Monday mornings. They met in front of the lunch meets. Margaret took a deep breath and said offhandedly, we're thinking about having the reception at the curling club. <laughs> Winnie said, what reception? <laughs> Margaret said, oh, didn't I tell you? She suspected that would do the trick. And she was right. Everyone in town knew by lunch. <laughs> and it didn't go as badly as Margaret had imagined. It went worse than she had imagined. <laughs> When you're 84 years old, <laughs> you don't want people treating you as if you were cute. Everyone thought it was cute. Everyone thought it was sweet. Makes me wish you had some sort of problem, she said to Smith as they were walking his dog along the gut. Couldn't you start drinking or something? <laughs> and that was before Bernadette and Winnie were warmed up. That was before Bernadette and Winnie started up about what Margaret should wear. I don't want it to be a big fancy thing, said Margaret. I'm not advising a floor-length gown, said Winnie. Bernadette nodded in agreement. In fact, said Winnie, I'd advise against it. You need a proper dress and jacket. I know a lady in Halifax who does a lovely job with seed pearls. They were at the post office. They were in front of the mailboxes. While Winnie was talking, Bernadette had pulled a tape measure out of her purse. Before Margaret knew what was happening, Bernadette was wrapping it around her middle. We are not, said Margaret, pulling the tape measure from her waist, going to Halifax. There is nothing like a wedding to addle people's minds. Especially, it turns out, if those people have spent too much of their recent years planning funerals. As April opened into May, everyone in Big Narrows, everyone of a certain age, that is, was fussing over the first big celebration that had come their way in decades. Patty Ann Madigan called to tell Margaret about a hybrid rose that she had read about in the Reader's Digest. It was named after Diana, the Princess of Wales. It has such a beautiful scent, said Patty Ann, who had never actually smelled one. George McDonnell from the Legion ambushed her in the parking lot at Kerrigan's. We best be nailing down the reception, said George. Lots of other events happening that month. The Sausage Festival is on the 12th, you know. <laughs> now, have you been to book on the music now, Margaret? Said Alf McDonald when he zeroed in on her in front of the roving library. Sid should be home, you know. Alf's son, Sid who DJs at a hip-hop club in Yarmouth. 
He'll be in Halifax the week of the wedding, said Alf. He's getting his tattoo worked on. <laughs> Sid has been slowly adding to his art as he can afford it. When it's finished, his tattoo will cover his entire body and tell the life story of Celine Dion <laughs> with a lavish wedding scene covering most of his back. <laughs> Margaret began to dread going out. Wherever she went, there was someone hovering with some sort of unwanted advice. She didn't leave her house for three days. On the fourth, she phoned Smith. She said, I can't do this. We can't get married. She expected he would come over and try to talk her out of it, or more to the point, into it. He didn't try to talk her into it. He said, that's okay, I understand. That night, Margaret went up to the attic with a box of winter stuff. She wasn't planning on bringing any summer stuff down, but once she got up there, she began poking around. When she climbed into the far corner, she came face to face with Charlie's uniform from the war. It was hanging on a post. It was wrapped in a plastic dry cleaner's bag. According to the tag, it had last been cleaned in April 1963. There was a shoe box beneath it. She knew what was in it. It was filled with letters Charlie had written her from England. She flicked on an old lamp and sat in its orange glow for the longest time reading those letters. Dear one, we arrived here at 7 p.m. and I half thought there might be a wire. It's absurd to think I have only been away for a week. Her eyes flicked to the bottom of the page. Now, my dearest love, I must say good night. It's nearly 12. God bless you, my dear, dear girl. There was a box of photo albums somewhere. When she finished the letter, she took the first photo album and settled it in her lap. Pictures of the kids. David, maybe five years old. And there was their first car. It looked so ancient. She ran her finger across the page as if she could reach back through time, as if she could touch the past by touching the little black and white photos, the white borders, the serrated edges. There were titles under each picture, printed in white ink on the black paper in Charlie's hand. Annie at the beach. Hungry Dave. Bath time. She opened the next book. It was her wedding pictures. She slammed it shut. She stood up and started for the stairs, and then she took a deep breath, and she sat down, and she opened the book again. It was past midnight when she left the attic. She drove to Smith's house first thing the next morning. She let herself in through the side door. I was getting worried, said Smith. I'm sorry, she said. That's okay, he said. No apology necessary. She was carrying a pile of books in her arms. She dropped them on the kitchen table. The photo albums. Sit down, she said. I'm going to tell you everything about me. And that is what they did. They sat in the kitchen and she told him the story of her life. He already knew most of it. But he'd never heard it all in one piece like that, from the very beginning to the end. They looked at the pictures. They read the old letters from Charlie. When she was finished, she said, Now you know everything. Now I have no secrets from you. You know it all, from beginning to end. Not quite to the end, said Smith. There's still a bit more left. They were married on July the 10th. There were only 20 people at the ceremony, but most of the town came to the reception. Many of them were kids that she had taught. They held the reception in the school gym, Smith's idea. Dave gave the toast to the bride. He said the nicest things, but oh, the dress. Margaret finally agreed to go shopping in Halifax. She got the ivory suit from the lady who did the pearl detailing. Well, she didn't exactly get it. Winnie and Bernadette did. 
Winnie said it was perfect. Bernadette agreed. Margaret thought otherwise. Makes me look like one of those real estate ladies from the city. She said that to Dave one night on the phone. I'm sure you look just fine, said Dave. And he was right. She did look just fine. But she never liked it. And so on that Saturday, on their way to the church as they were driving down River Street, Margaret turned to Dave, who was driving her, and said, pull in there and park. Dave glanced at his wristwatch. Margaret frowned at him and said, you don't think they'll start without us, do you, David? <laughs> Dave knew better than to answer that. So he parked Smith's truck, which he was driving, and he followed his mother into Rutledge's hardware store without saying a word. Margaret winked at Dave as they marched up to the counter together. Sandy Rutledge, he heard her say, how much for that wedding dress in the window? <laughs> she paid $29 for the dress. <laughs> Tax in. She changed in the staff washroom. They were in and out of the hardware store in under 15 minutes. When they pulled up to the church, Dave put his hand on his mother's arm and stopped her from getting out of the car. He smiled at her and he said, I'm happy for you. Margaret said, me too. Smith threw his head back and laughed when he saw Margaret in the dress. He was beaming as she walked down the aisle on Dave's elbow. Winnie and Bernadette looked horrified. <laughs> But they got over it. How could they not? Margaret looked radiant. She barely left the dance floor. She danced with all the young men she had taught all those years ago. And she danced with Dave and with Sam and Arnie Gallagher and Rodney McDowell. She even danced with Smith, who told her when they had finished dancing that he loved her dearly, but that would be the last time he'd ever dance with her. Or anyone, he added, never again, he whispered in her ear. She just laughed and kissed him on the cheek and whispered, we'll see about that, <laughs> as he left the dance floor laughing. She danced the night away. It was her wedding, after all. She'd already had for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. This was the part that she had given up on. This was happily ever after. <laughs>